Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. When reading the Bible, I'm always overwhelmed by the ancientness of the stories. Reading about the long lifespans in Genesis, wondering who is real and who is a combination of people, or who didn't exist at all, and wondering what it all means is, frankly, a great challenge. I read the Bible somewhat regularly, but more out of intrigue and interest due to the book's huge impact on world history. Each time I read it, I'm impressed, but I'm also unsure of what facts and pieces of the stories I believe and don't believe. So recently I received a book in the mail that added a layer of wonder to my reading of the Bible. The question reads, the Bible describes many individuals and groups as specially chosen by God, but does God choose at all? The book is called God's Favorites, Judaism, Christianity, and the Myth of Divine Chosenness, and it's by biblical scholar Dr. Michael Coogan from Harvard University. Dr. Michael Coogan is a lecturer on Old Testament and Hebrew Bible at Harvard Divinity School and the director of publications for the Harvard Semitic Museum. He is the author of God and Sex, The Ten Commandments, A Short History of an Ancient Text, The Old Testament, a historical and literary introduction to the Hebrew scriptures, and numerous textbooks on the Old Testament. He joined me on the phone to talk about his brand new book, God's Favorites, Judaism, Christianity, and the Myth of Divine Chosenness, out from Beacon Press in April 2019. We dig into questions during this conversation about the challenges of teaching about the Bible in non-denominational and secular contexts, the human authorship of the Bible, interpretations of Christianity between James and Paul, and the crossover and mixing of religious practices found in the Middle East in biblical times. If these types of mysteries fascinate you, you will almost certainly enjoy this conversation, and you will definitely enjoy the book. Please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Michael Coogan. Welcome to Classical Ideas. Dr. Michael Coogan, thank you so much for joining me on the show. It's great to be with you, Doug. Thank you. Can you just spend a moment and sort of introduce yourself to the audience, however you see fit? So I am currently the director of publications for the Harvard Semitic Museum, and I'm also the editor of Oxford Biblical Studies Online and the new Oxford Annotated Bible. I have, uh, I'm a retired professor. I have taught at Harvard University, Wellesley College, Stonehill College, and other places. And for the last 45 or so years, I've been, I would describe myself as a biblical scholar. I got my doctorate in um, biblical studies, actually Near Eastern Languages and Literatures in 1971, and I've been teaching and writing ever since. Fantastic. So, teacher to teacher, I want to start off our conversation today about a course that you taught. And in 2011, you taught a course at Harvard Divinity School about the myth of divine chosenness. And this course was the uh, instigating factor in leading you to write a book that we're going to discuss in depth today. Um, So, first of all, can you tell me a little bit about this course idea and how it got in your head and how it developed? Well, when I was teaching at Harvard Divinity School, I taught um, fairly regularly an introduction to the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament. And then I taught uh, sort of topical courses. I taught a course on the book of Job. I taught one on the Psalms. And I decided that that year, 2011, that I just wanted to do something new. And I had been playing with this idea of chosen people for some time. It's a very central idea in the Bible. And I thought it would be worth exploring in more depth with my students. And so I did. And it eventually took a while, but it eventually turned into this book. The course was simply called The Chosen People. Um, I added to the book as I was writing it the idea of the myth of divine chosenness, 
Excellent. Um, so as you were teaching this course, what was the reception of the course from your students? Because, you know, you talk about the the myth of chosenness, and I would imagine that many of your former students are extremely devoted believers. Um, so how did the students enjoy the class? Uh, what were some of their big things that they struggled with or uh, liked about the class? So Harvard Divinity School is a <clears throat> non-denominational school, and I also had a couple of undergraduates taking the course. Um, so it, it's the student body is very heterogeneous. There are There's a whole spectrum of a belief and observance uh, of many religious traditions. Um, some of them were devoted believers, but some of them were Christians, some were Jews. And when I teach, I, do, I try to teach in such a way so that I'm not trying to get people to believe something or to stop believing something. Once at the end of a semester when I had taught uh, Introduction to the Hebrew Bible Old Testament, a student came up to me after the last class and said, asked me, are you Christian or are you Jewish? <laughs> and I told him, but I thought that was, I was pleased with that question because it meant I had presented the material in, a, in an objective enough way so that no matter where on the spectrum of belief and observance one stands, one could get something out of it. And they didn't feel that they had to, that they were being threatened or um, converted or anything else. Brilliant. Okay, so that's basically my approach to teaching religious studies at the high school level as well. And I take great pride in myself, and my I feel like I've done a good job whenever students ask me that question at the end of the year as well. So I know that feeling exactly. Um, so you have this uh, compelling and intricately researched new book called God's Favorites, Judaism, Christianity, and the Myth of Divine Chosenness, coming out in April 2019 from Beacon Press, which is next week before we're talking. So congratulations on the impending release of the book. Thank you very much. And you take great care in explaining the word, your use of the word myth in the book's subtitle. Can you explain why that term myth is important to you as the author and why um, you use that in the subtitle of the book? So I use the term myth in <clears throat> two basic senses. In ancient literature, a myth is a story, a narrative in which a god or gods are principal characters. Myths often have to do with um, the creation of the world by a god or goddess, for example. Uh, so one of the principal characters in the Bible, of course, is God, um, known by various names and titles, but we'll just call him God for now. Um, and so the stories in which God is a major character are, in that sort of literary sense, myths. But I also use the term myth in the kind of more colloquial sense of something that is not true. It's a myth that George Washington cut down the cherry tree. It's also a kind of legend, but it's a myth. It's false. Uh, and I think I want to make it clear from the title of my book that I don't believe, I don't think, that God, presuming that he exists, actually chooses one person or one group and in doing so, gives them preferential treatment. So I think that that is a, ultimately a false idea. Excellent. Before we dive into some of the chapters, I want to read a quote that uh, I absolutely loved and I want to share. So in the book on page 87, you write, Because the Bible is an anthology of works written by human beings, over many hundreds of years, we should read it not as divine revelation, not as God's word about God, but rather as what different writers thought about God and how they projected onto God their own views, especially to enhance the status of groups to which they belonged. Now, this quote jumped out at me, and it made complete sense to me because I'm just an enthusiast of these topics. Um, I just like reading about these things and talking about them. How common is the belief 
in biblical inerrancy and divine revelation in 2019? Is this more common or less common than we may think about? Well, I think it depends upon where you stand. And I would say, essentially, you're talking about fundamentalism, and there is a kind of remarkable growth in fundamentalism in all sorts of religious traditions around the world today. Um, That's true of Hinduism in India, it's true of Islam, it's true of Judaism, uh, both in Israel and elsewhere. And it's also true of Christianity, especially in the United States and in the developing world. Um, It's not as common in sort of post-Christian societies, especially Western Europe. You know, if you travel in Europe and go to see a cathedral and it happens to be a Sunday and there's a mass taking place, uh, the the pews are virtually empty. Um, So I think it's fairly common, but I think it depends upon where you're situated. Okay. Um, I I think it's also... um, the ends of the spectrum, as is also true of politics, I think, are becoming farther and farther apart. And our people who are <clears throat> who believe in biblical inerrancy and inspiration are <clears throat> not willing to have reasonable conversations about uh, what somebody else might believe. Yeah, you know, and that really jumped out at me as well, because... Um, I feel like something like, you know, Democrat or Republican, um, evangelical or mainline, these are, you know, polar opposite terms in a lot of people's lives. And I feel like um, if we think about it, conversations are tending to get more and more difficult in society if we let ourselves believe that. And one of the things I love about this book is that um, you are still seeking to communicate across those lines. So do you have any like strategies for communication with students or readers who may vehemently disagree with your take that the Bible is not inerrant? Like, how do you compose yourself in such conversations whenever there's that stark um, stop line of inerrant versus inerrant and things like that? So, as I said before, I don't, you know, my purpose in writing this book is not necessarily to either to get somebody to stop believing something or to convert them to my own beliefs. It is rather, as also in my teaching, to get people to think about uh, the evidence and where the evidence might take us. And I'm not trying to give them, you know, saying he... At the same time, when I do that, and in this book I'm doing more than I have done in the past, I'm I'm being more personal and more autobiographical in a sense. I'm telling people, here's where I stand now, and here's how I got to this position, and here's where I came from. And for me, it was a, it has been, continues to be uh, a fascinating and um, challenging journey. Um, and I, I hope that people will respect that just as you know, I am on a journey, we are all on a journey together seeking um, greater understanding. We are not adversaries. Um, <clears throat> we're doing, we're, we both, uh, we all love, you know, if I'm teaching a class, we all have some interest, at least in this book we call the Bible, and let's see what it actually says. Yeah, I actually loved your your autobiographical portions of the book um, because you really do let the reader in to where you stand on issues, um, but it, it's so well-researched as well. It's interesting because, you know, in the last t- 10 or so years, I've <clears throat> stopped writing sort of learned articles for scholarly journals, and I've done more of this sort of stuff for a general audience. Uh, and I think um, one of the reasons that the approach that I take, which is shared by the majority of biblical scholars, whatever their religious background, um, <clears throat> in North America and um, and Europe at least, um, most of us, I think, don't do enough to make the results of our scholarship and research accessible. So I'm, what I'm trying to do is present what a colleague of mine once called accessible scholarship. Um, and I think biblical scholars especially have an obligation to do that. Otherwise, the arena is left 
to the fanatics and the crazies. And if you go on the web, you'll see all sorts of fanaticism and craziness having to do with the Bible. Yeah, I definitely appreciate your approach to um, writing for a general audience and bringing this expertise to as big of an audience as you can. And as we mentioned, as I mentioned in our phone call last week, I mean, this is such a thorough book, but it's it's short as well. I mean, this is a really, really accessible text that I think that can uh, really speak to a lot of people. So I appreciate that. Well, thank you. So I want to talk a little bit about the uh, chosenness myth you discuss thoroughly in the book. And throughout the centuries, uh, many groups have claimed divine chosenness and acted with holy nationalism, as you call it, which is a term that I really latched onto. What are some examples of populations who claim chosenness, maybe some that we haven't thought about in the West? And what does that mean? Uh, what does holy nationalism look like in practice? Well, all sorts of <clears throat> individuals and groups throughout history have claimed to be special in some ways, and they have uh, identified or the, the, the origin of that special status as having been divine choice. I'm not an expert in <clears throat> all religions, but I, I think it's true of, of China, for example, and in closer to my area of expertise, it's certainly true of, for example, the ancient Egyptians, who thought that they had been specially blessed by the sun god, and the rest of humanity was in a lesser state. Um, in And in the ancient world, more generally, um, this is fairly frequent. So the Babylonian king Hammurabi in the 18th century claimed that <clears throat> the god of Babylon, the chief god of Babylon, Marduk, had chosen Hammurabi as king. Um, the Romans claimed that um, the founder of Rome, Aeneas, or what became Rome, Aeneas, had been chosen by the god Jupiter. Um, and all sorts of other um, kings from the ancient world claimed that they had been installed by divine right. And the same is true of the Bible. Um, biblical writers claim that God chose David to be king over Israel and chose his successors, his dynasty, to rule in Jerusalem, the Bible says, forever. Um, the, the dynasty that David founded lasted some 400 years, which is a good long time as dynasties go, but it isn't exactly forever. <laughs> I think that one of the reasons that, and I'm speaking now just about rulers, I think one of the reasons that rulers do this is because it's a, it's a shrewd political move. If they can get people, that are, their subjects, to believe, if a ruler can get his or her subjects to believe that he or she has been divinely chosen, then it undercuts any possibility of revolt or rebellion, because an attack on the ruler is ultimately an attack on the deity, the God, who chose that move. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of brilliant um, political move. And I think uh, the same applies in an analogous way to groups identifying themselves as divinely chosen. And throughout history, various groups have done this. Uh, I, as I said in the beginning, I'm a biblical scholar, and so I'm interested in primarily in the Bible, and I focus especially on <clears throat> the ancient Israelites as God's chosen people, and then how uh, following, and then how early Christians assumed that status for themselves, and that same status has subsequently been assumed by other groups, and I focus in the book especially on two. Um, I focus on the United States, the view in the United States, sometimes called Manifest Destiny, that we have been chosen by God, by providence, as a special people in the world. We are God's new chosen people. We are, as one scholar has put it, we think of ourselves often as God's new Israel. Um, so that's one modern example that I spend a bit of time on. And the other is... Um, one aspect of Zionism, which is ultra-religious Zionism, which claims a kind of continuity between uh, 
biblical promises about the land of Israel uh, <clears throat> thousands of years ago and uh, what's happening today in Israel and Palestine. Gotcha. Yeah, and if you think about the um, the negative consequences of something like Manifest Destiny, it reverberates across the centuries, across this entire continent. And you mentioned earlier that if you can get the populace to believe in that concept, well, then those ugly consequences kind of get brushed under the rug a little bit. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, so if <clears throat> if the first settlers of New England thought of themselves as a Providence plantation as God's new Israel, then the Bible gave them fairly clear directives about how to deal with the native populations, just as the Bible says God instructed Joshua to kill all of the inhabitants of the land. So mistreatment, extermination, and expropriation of land of the Native Americans by the English settlers was perfectly justified because of the biblical model. Speaking of imperialism and imperialistic contexts, you write that the Bible takes place in an imperialistic context. And in this context, um, I'm curious how much uh, of the imperialism discussed in the Bible is discussed by modern churches. What do you think that everybody should know about the context of the Bible if they're, you know, in church on Sunday or reading it um in 2019, what is some of the context that you think is most important for people to consider today? Well, I think it's important to recognize that the ancient Israelites and the early Christians for, for, for several centuries were uh, a distinct minority in the world and a relatively powerless minority. The ancient Israelites, for most of their history, were at the mercy of much greater powers, Egypt to their south, West and Babylon and Assyria, Assyria and Babylon to their northeast. And they, so they did live under the shadow of empire. And to some extent, this gave identifying themselves, the underdogs, as God's chosen people, gave them some comfort and consolation. But it also, I think, and th this may be the most important thing, it made them recognize that the powerless, however they are identified, um, need help more than anybody else because of their own experience of being powerless. Um, we're talking just a few weeks before Passover and Easter, and Passover and Easter, of course, are connected. And um, the story of Passover is the story of a group suffering slavery and oppression, escaping that slavery and oppression. And throughout the Bible, um, biblical writers appeal to that experience. You know what it was like to be a slave. You know what it was like to be an immigrant. You know what it was like to be oppressed. So remember that when you had slaves, when you had immigrants in your midst and so forth. Um, so I think the... the um, the idea of imperialism actually serves as a kind of uh, catalyst for what I think are some of the Bible's highest principles, um, especially that of loving one's neighbor, whoever one's neighbor happens to be. Fantastic. And, you know, something that else that strikes me when I was reading this the other night is you dissect a lot of early stories in the Bible, such as those of Abraham, Noah, and more. And you, um, as, a, as a biblical scholar, there's some skepticism about some figures in the Bible and if they even existed. And at one point, I was intrigued when you called the family of Abraham uh, unremarkable. And because I thought about how millions of people around the world might say that that's a controversial statement. Um, do you view the doubt about specific people existing as controversial? Um, why or why not? Well, let me let me explain what I meant when I said that they were unremarkable. Yes, please. I, you know, as they are as they are described in the Bible, Abraham and his extended family, which you know included his 
two wives and then his son and his wife. And then later, as the, as the family moved on, um, his grandson, Jacob, and Jacob's four wives and 70 children and so forth. Um, but they were semi-nomads with their flocks of sheep and goats, basically on the move a lot. Mm-hmm. And they were unremarkable in the sense that nobody took note of them. Right. We have all sorts of records from ancient Egypt, from ancient Babylon, from ancient Mesopotamia and elsewhere. And nowhere is Abraham, the son of Terah, or Isaac, the son of Abraham, or Jacob, the son of Isaac, mentioned in any of these non-biblical sources. And I think that's not surprising because they were really on the fringe. They were extras on the set of world history, so to speak. Um, so can we say that Abraham existed, or Isaac, or Jacob? Well, we, I don't know if we can. Um, there are certainly vivid characters in the Bible, um, some more than others, and they existed to that extent. They were identified as the ancestors of, of the Israelites, so they existed to that extent. But I don't think we could say with any historical certainty that they actually lived. We don't even know when they lived. Scholars disagree by, you know, over several hundreds of years about when Abraham might have lived, because biblical chronology is so um, unreliable. I think it's, you know, did they, is it controversial to say Abraham didn't exist? I don't think so. On the other hand, where we do have evidence for people existing, um, then I think it would be extremely hyper-skeptical to say, well, Jesus, for example, never existed. I think that would be, I think we have enough non-biblical evidence to suggest that that would be absurd. Okay. Is there a point, like, in the story, in the Bible, where you as a scholar feel comfortable saying this person almost certainly existed? Like, is there a historical cutoff where the documented historical record is, um, you know, sort of in line with what we read in the Bible? So it's a, it, it's, it, it, it's a gradual process. Um, the first um, persons mentioned in the Bible also known from non-biblical sources, are from the 10th century BCE. One is an Egyptian pharaoh known as Shishak, um, and another is a king of Tyre on the coast of southern Lebanon today uh, named Hiram. Those are historical people whom we know about, not just from the Bible, but from other sources. I would add to that category David, Although David is not mentioned in any contemporaneous sources, there is reference a couple centuries later to the house of David. And so I think it's reasonable to assume, and most scholars would agree with this, that there once was a guy named David who ruled, I don't know quite how magnificently, but who was king or leader uh, in Jerusalem. As time goes on, there are more and more of these correlations between people and events named in the Bible and in non-biblical sources. Uh, kings paying, biblical kings paying tribute to foreign rulers. Battles between um, um, foreign powers and, and Israel or Judah. Um, and in, in some ways, that's really ominous. This gets back to that imperialistic context I was talking about before. The more Israel is mentioned, or, is, or individuals in Israel are mentioned in non-biblical sources, the more ominous it becomes. They are no longer, um, as we were saying, unremarkable. They are worth noticing, but they're usually in trouble because they're being defeated, they're being forced to pay tribute, their cities are being destroyed, they're being sent into exile, and so forth. Hey, by about 800 B.C., okay. um, biblical chronology is completely meshed with non-biblical sources, and so um, certainly by 800, and I would say as far back as 1,000. Wow, that's actually—that's that, older than I was anticipating. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm putting David there, and Hiram, the king of Tyre, and Shishak invaded Israel— 
Uh, the, the Pharaoh Farshak invaded Israel about 928 or so, that's B.C., and um, the Bible talks about it, and Farshak himself talks about it. So, um, Great, I love it. So um, I want to talk a little bit about practice and how uh, religions and traditions have um, the... You know, we have the tendency to borrow practices from other cultures. And I'm reading a book right now by another author about something called religious fluidity and how we borrow practices from other traditions, whether it be kneeling or bowing or using prayer beads. And as I was reading your two books simultaneously, um, I saw a quote that you wrote, and you wrote, not only was the Bible not handed down by God from heaven in installments, but also in most respects, it was not unique. Its ideas and values, its laws and institutions, its stories and myths, even its idioms resemble those of neighbors and rulers of the biblical writers, the ancient Babylonians, Egyptians, Canaanites, Greeks, Romans, and others. And you argue that this makes sense since the authors didn't live in a cultural bubble. Um, Can you talk a little bit about the examples of explicitly like borrowed or um, other parts and practices that you think that most people may not have heard of, um, but like they didn't know that it was borrowed from another culture or things that they have heard of, but they didn't know that it was borrowed from another culture. So I, I'm not sure that borrowing is necessarily always the best term because I think that, you know, the, the, the Middle East is a relatively small place and I, I would prefer to think of um, the cultures as, you know, a, a Middle Eastern culture generally as sort of one large culture where there were shared, the languages are very closely related. And the Semitic languages are more closely related than the uh, Romance languages, for example. Um, so I think that they, you know, they were reading each other's stuff. They were talking to each other and, you know, if somebody had an idea, well, this is a neat way to build a house. Well, then I'll build it the same way. Yeah. If this is a nice style of pottery, well, I'll do that. That's a kind of borrowing, but, it, you know, it's not um, exactly plagiarism. So famous examples in the Bible. I mean, there's a flood story in Genesis, which has very close parallels to ancient Mesopotamian flood stories. I think the biblical writers in that case probably did borrow the flood story. But when <clears throat> the biblical writers talk about the God of Israel as a storm God who appears on a mountain surrounded by smoke and there's thunder and lightning and earthquake and so forth, that language is found in uh, other religious traditions of the ancient Near East as well. And I think it's not that they, you know, say, well, uh, we're going to borrow that from the Canaanites. Or I think it was a more um, gradual and integrated pr- process. Um, I always ask my, uh, whenever I would teach 10th grade English, we would always read Gilgamesh. And having the students read the flood stories in the Epic of Gilgamesh and watching their yep. their light bulbs turn on. I mean, that was one of my favorite <laughs> yeah. units as a teacher because they would just blow their minds. Well, it, 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 it blew everybody's minds. <laughs> it has since 18, 1878 when it was deciphered by this guy in the British Museum. <laughs> it's Great so good. Story. Um, so you have a chapter on Christianity that what is truly incredible. I absolutely loved it, and I'm sorry if I'm fawning a little bit, but I loved the chapter. It was so good. And you write how Jesus clearly teaches that people should obey the Torah, and in fact, Jesus isn't even trying to start a new religion, and James clearly says people should stick to the laws in the Torah. But then you got this guy named Paul, or um, who changes it all up. And out of James and Paul, in your book, James clearly appears to be the closer of the two to Jesus' actual teachings. How do you think that Christianity would look differently today, or would it even exist if it weren't for Paul and his um, revisions? That's a great question. Um, you know, when I, I used to teach a survey course in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and in the Christianity part, I sort of posed the hypothetical question, who is the founder of Christianity? <laughs> 
Mm. You know, was Jesus the founder of Christianity? Did he intend to found a new religion? As you suggest, I don't think he did. Uh, he saw himself more as a prophet in the ancient tradition of trying to bring um, his contemporaries back to a proper understanding of what God wanted as he understood it. Um, certainly, um, Christianity as we know it, as more than a, just a sort of subset of Judaism, it, uh, is due to Paul, and so Paul, in that sense, he could be called the founder of Christianity, but of course you couldn't have Christianity without Jesus either, so I, it's, a, it's a complicated issue. Um, Paul certainly changed things, and that his primary mission was to non-Jews. That's very different from the way the gospel suggests Jesus saw his own mission. Um, and that changed Christianity inevitably and resulted in a great deal of controversy and division, as you suggest, about how much people had to observe all of the requirements of the Torah. One of the main issues that divided groups was circumcision. And um, Gentile, did, did you have to be a, an observant Jew in order to be a Christian? And if you were an observant Jew, then you had to be circumcised. And I suspect that many of the adult male converts that Paul made would have preferred not to be circumcised. And Paul supported them in this. Um, so it's not surprising that Paul and James disagree because they're reflecting an ongoing debate in Christianity in the first century about Christian identity. To what extent is Christianity Jewish? To what extent is it not? What does that mean in terms of God's attitude toward the Jews? What does it mean in terms of Christians' attitude toward Jews? Uh, eventually, of course, um, until the relatively recently, what scholars call Jewish Christianity, people who believe that Jesus was the Messiah, but who continued to think of themselves as Jews, as Paul himself did. I mean, Paul himself didn't stop being Jewish. He was an observant Jew all of his life, and he worshipped in the temple, and so forth. Um, but eventually, that branch of Christianity, that Jewish branch, that original branch of Christianity, um, died out. Hmm. You know, and the attitude of Christians towards Jews and the attitudes towards Jews in generally is also present in your book. And this got me thinking a lot about the issues in the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke and the Gospel of John as well. Um, so I'm curious about the some of the anti some of the disturbing anti-Judaism. In John, uh, you mentioned some notable examples throughout the book, such as Jesus saying things like, quote, your law when referring to Jews, or saying that true Israelites um, believed in Jesus, um, therefore excluding Jews. I'm curious if you think that John should be used in academic religious studies courses, and if you can just kind of talk generally about those Gospels. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the Synoptic Gospels because they, uh, except at the very beginning and at the end, they basically have the same plot, uh, they feature the same episodes, and speaking of borrowing, uh, they, uh, they are often uh, <clears throat> verse for verse, um, even paragraph by paragraph the same. So they are borrowing and copying from each other, and scholars have tried to figure out exactly how that happened. Even in the Synoptic Gospels, which are written some 40 or more years after the death of Jesus, so they're not eyewitness accounts by any means, we begin to have a kind of anti-Judaism in this sense. Um, who is responsible for the death of Jesus? Uh, Christians, these Christian writers at least, um, thought that Jesus had been rejected by the very people that God had sent him to try to bring back to proper observance of the Torah. And they saw a pattern in this rejection because Jesus was not the first prophet to have been turned on by his own people. 
Um, so there is a kind of implicit anti-Judaism, but is it only against the Jews of Jesus' own day, or does it go farther than that? And I think the Gospel of John is shockingly um, going farther. Um, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is, um, as you suggest, presented almost as somebody who is not Jewish, which is obviously not the case, mm -hmm. and uh, is quoted as saying that those who uh, oppose him, those who reject him, have the devil as their father. And Christians have taken that language, and it has led to the horrible and horribly tragic history of anti-Semitism in Christianity for the last, you know, now going on almost 2,000 years. Um, should the Gospel of John be taught? Of course. Um, because I think it's important to understand the Bible with all of its warts and difficulties. These are the words, as you suggested I say earlier, uh, these are the words of men and mostly, and a few women, who were very much a product of their own times and who therefore, you know, are reflecting their own experiences, their own understandings of the world around them, and also their own biases. Mm -hmm. That's why we have such disagreement uh, in the Bible about all sorts of issues. Um, and I think it's important to point out those inconsistencies. It's not as though the Bible speaks with one clear, simple message. You know, another thing I appreciated in the book is that you kind of offer a sort of a challenge to the intellectual and academic community, um, to me at least. You clearly argue about the intellectual blind spot that some biblical scholars who also might be believers tend to have. And I'm, I'm sorry if I mischaracterize that. I'll let you talk about this in just a second. Do you feel that scholarship and faith in the, in the words of the texts are at odds w against intellectual and civilizational progress? I think what's, it, it, I don't think they're at odds in the text. I think it's what people bring to the text. If people come to the text with a presupposition that it is all God's word, it is the word of God, the only word of God, um, then they have problems um, explaining the inconsistencies and I would add the repetitions that I mentioned before. If, if God wrote the Bible, then God is not a very good writer at all. Hmm. Because start trying to read the Bible from the beginning and see how far you get. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's hard. It's hard. Um, what I was talking about was, I think, a kind of... So, so, so the ideal of what, what scholars call historical critical scholarship, which, belong in, which began in the 18th century in, uh, on the continent in Europe, um, is to be as objective as possible, to, be, to interpret this text without any presuppositions, um, not theological presuppositions, not dogmatic presuppositions, not any presuppositions about what it might say or what it might mean. And to look at it critically, not negatively necessarily, but critically, the way a book critic or a film critic would review a book or a film, trying to be as open as possible. Um, I think one of the problems, and I, this is the autographical part that I you know, t discussed at the beginning of the book, I mean, most biblical scholars start off from a fairly pious perspective, a believing perspective, an observant perspective. That's what brings them to the Bible in the first place. And the study of the Bible, um, and especially the Bible in its context, makes it results in a more nuanced understanding of what the Bible is. And so, in a sense, you know, you can't go home again. Um, 
it doesn't mean you give up the Bible. You don't necessarily give up all of its values. But I think you have to come to terms with how your previous beliefs um, have been transformed by the study of the Bible itself. You know, Paul puts it this way. You know, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child. But now that I am an adult, I have changed. And in a sense, that's the journey I've been on. And I think um, some some of my colleagues, past and present, haven't um, taken enough steps on that journey. In the book you write about, in your classes, you ask students to discuss how they feel the Bible is and is not relevant today. What do they say? So most people, I think will choose those parts of the Bible that they find congenial or in line with their own presuppositions. If you are opposed to same-sex marriage, then Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20 will be very relevant for you today. Um, I don't think that... (laughs) That's the only thing to be said about same-sex relationships, even based on the Bible. Um, but I think that the Bible is also relevant, I think, for students because it is used so much in contemporary political discourse. There's more than one book out there that suggests, to my view, ironic, in my view, ironically, that the current president, that President Trump, was chosen by God. Mm. For this high office, well, that's what I would call the myth of divine chosenness. And they would base that on biblical passages. The former Attorney General uh, Sessions, um, speaking about observance of the law, quoted Romans 11 or 13. I forget about, you know, all authorities have been put in place by God. Um, Well, Romans does say that, but what Paul it's not entirely clear what Paul's attitude toward the Roman Empire was and to Roman authorities. So it's easy to find things in the Bible, to cherry-pick the Bible, so to speak, to find parts of it that will reinforce and legitimate uh, and rationalize one's own views and prejudices. And so I think the important thing is to take the Bible as a whole, and with all of its difficulties, because I think that will lead to a greater understanding of what underlies the Bible. We've brushed on some positive, I mean, some, some, uh, we've brushed on some negative effects of things like holy nationalism and chosenness. Do you think there are any positive long term effects of holy nationalism and chosenness that we can see around us today? What good has this done? Well, that's a a challenging question, and I'm not sure I could answer it positively. (laughs) Hmm. Um, I think it is a kind of tribalism, Hmm. and I think tribalism, uh, nativism, which we're seeing, I think, too much of around the world now, is uh, ultimately divisive. Um, It is building walls instead of tearing down walls. And I think that's especially important at this moment in our history as a species, where we are apparently on the verge of destroying our own environment. And we cannot um, engage in, you know, sort of solitary national action or inaction without taking into account what is happening to the rest of the world. It doesn't matter whether we think we have been chosen by God or not. I think we have an obligation to think of ourselves, all humans, as one species. We are all one tribe, not separate tribes, and we are certainly no one group of us, however superficially defined by language, by ethnicity, by physical features or anything else. No one special group of us should claim, or I think can claim, that they are somehow special in the eyes of God. Well, Dr. Michael Coogan, I am 
really grateful to you for your uh, for your time today. Um, I really enjoyed reading God's Favorites, Judaism, Christianity, and the Myth of Divine Chosenness this past week. And I think that pretty much anybody who listens into this show will get a lot out of this text. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, where people can find you if they want to follow your work? Maybe tell us a little bit about the Harvard Semitic Museum. Well, the Harvard Semitic Museum is a relatively small museum in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It has a, some exhibits, but you can see much more interesting and exciting stuff in um, all sorts of museums in this country and around the world. Uh, so we're primarily a research museum, and I'm involved with the editing and production of, you know, very technical um, works about archaeology and grammar and history and things like that. Um, at the same time, as I suggested earlier, I'm trying to do more of what I call accessible scholarship. And before this book that we've been talking about today, I have one book on the Ten Commandments, um, which I think people might find interesting. And and before that, there's a title that will be easy to remember, God and Sex, oh, What yeah. the Bible Really Says. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so you've got all kinds of great stuff out there all right well um dr michael coogan this has been a real pleasure thank you so much for spending time with me today on classical ideas thank you very much greg it's been a great pleasure for me too Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Streibig. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you like this show, please rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can email me at classicalideas at outlook.com. Or find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash classical ideas podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Mm-hmm.